¿Qué sería de mí si no me hubieras alcanzado? ¿Dónde estaría hoy si no me hubieras perdonado? Tendría un vacío en mi corazón, vagaría sin rumbo, sin dirección. Si no fuera por tu gracia y por tu amor. What is it about the minimum level of the anointing of the Holy Spirit that characterizes the five foolish virgins, even as the Lord was speaking to this church, the current church? What is it that was harmful to them that made them not enter into the rapture? Hallelujah. Look at this, somebody. The Lord is saying that spiritual childhood which comes from operating in only the basic level of the anointing. Hallelujah. That spiritual level, which is so small, cannot withstand storms, and it leads to compromising the Christian walk. Hallelujah. That's why it is hazardous, it is dangerous to the lives of the five foolish virgins, because it will not permit them to enter the kingdom of God. Is somebody following me here? It is dangerous to them to the extent that it makes them be comfortable as spiritual infants in the flesh. You see that? So they have come from out, did not grow in the spirit of the Lord, and were essentially not transformed. No wonder... In verse 11 of Matthew 25, the Lord tells them, Later the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I do not know you. How can the Lord say he does not know them? What is the message he's giving to you today? He's saying that if you continue operating in spiritual childhood, spiritual infancy, with the basic level of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, without receiving more, then the spiritual transformation that is supposed to have taken place as you walk with that lamp in the waiting process in the darkness, the spiritual transformation will not take place in you. So essentially, you will not be wearing the identity of Christ. No wonder he cannot recognize you at the gate, at the door. He can be able to boldly tell you, to tell you the truth, I do not know you. Hallelujah. So that comes out of failure to go through spiritual transformation. And spiritual transformation can only take place through the authority and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But even the foolish virgins are operating under the Holy Spirit. Isn't that the mystery now? That means spiritual transformation requires an added level of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Because there are certain decisions that the bride of Christ has to make that have to be far removed from the physical decisions of the world. There are certain changes in this spiritual transformation that the perfect bride of Christ has to go through decisions that may be unpopular to the flesh, that may not make sense to the physical realm, hallelujah, that requires that she transitions into the spiritual realm. That means she needs to move to the next level of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. That's why that minimal level yields infancy, spiritual childhood, which is actually hazardous, toxic to the five foolish virgins. 
to the church we are seeing today in the world. The infant church where women can walk in with a minister without even asking and saying, just a moment, if the other religions cannot do this, how about I that serves the Holy One of Israel, the one and only true God, how can I even put on like this? You see that? But listen something else here, somebody. This spiritual childhood that the five foolish virgins were in is also toxic, is also hazardous and dangerous to the other Christians around her. You see that? Are you seeing that, somebody? Why am I saying so? Because at the time when everybody is trimming their lamps, hallelujah, because the midnight hour is here, you know every day that when you are burning a lamp and the oil becomes exhausted in that midnight hour, if you don't have the midnight oil to begin to burn, hallelujah, then you will start burning the wick. Do you hear me, somebody? And then it becomes sooty, begins to give small people, <coughs> people begin to cough in that room. Hallelujah. That means the quality of the light that the lamps of the five foolish virgins were giving in that peak season, peak time, when performance is a key factor, becomes compromised, the flame they have will be mixed with dark, with smoke now, soot, and many people nearby will cough, become toxic, pollute people. Hallelujah. And that's what you see in the church today. That's why they say, Ah, don't worry. The Lord does not look at your dressing. He looks at your heart. That's why they can be able to go into a very dangerous bandwagon, a dangerous caravan. They can all jump on a dangerous horse, thinking that the Lord will not hold them accountable to Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 on, when he says, Whoever looks at a woman and lusts at her has already committed adultery with her. Do you hear that, somebody? So they begin to write off the scripture. They say, ah, don't worry. The Lord, he looks at your heart, not your dressing. And yet we know very well that the Lord will hold them accountable. Somebody, do you hear me here? That is what I mean by the toxic nature, the dangerousness of the light, of the spiritual childhood, of the five foolish virgins, that did not have the anointing oil at the peak season, that now the smoke they emit, the light they emit is mixed with darkness, it is sooty, it is smoky. When you enter that room, many people ask, wow, is there no light in this room? No, but there is light. We have lit the candle. How come it's so dark? How, what's happening with this candle today? You see that? Because darkness begins to mix with their light. So they don't reflect the true light and life of Christ. And yet, that is the most critical time when they have to give the mirror image of Christ. That is when there is so much evil on earth. That is when the midnight storms are coming now. Hallelujah. And they need to perform. Let me bring it to another level. Spiritual infancy and childhood, which is typified, characterized by the five foolish virgins, also creates what we call immunity to the gospel. I want to bring you now even deeper. These are the people that are so immune to the gospel that they will say things like, don't worry, just put on that minister. The Lord he does not look at your physical dressing. He looks at your heart. Don't worry, you can just fall in sin and come back. Because once the Lord died for you, there's so much grace, there's so much love, there's so much peace, there's so much healing. Without knowing that Romans chapter 6, Paul asks, should we continue in sin? Should we just continue sinning so the grace may increase? And the answer is absolutely not. You see that? Let me bring it to another level, somebody. We know that the weak, the kitambi in the local Swahili of this nation of Kenya, the weak that is burning, that is sucking the oil, from where the oil is and giving the flame is your heart. Hallelujah. And we know that when the wick has been shredded, they are thinner, 
Hallelujah. It burns better than a wick which is a whole stump of stock. You see that? That means when Jesus was crucified, he essentially crucified the heart of the church. You see that? It is the heart that Jesus ever died for. There is nothing else he died for. He died for your heart. So when he crucified the church on the cross at Calvary on that day, essentially he crucified the heart, the sinful desires of the heart. Hallelujah. So the heart was shredded into a kitambi, a wick. The more shredded, the better. And when the shredded wick touches oil, it has a higher efficiency of sucking the oil. Let's talk these things today, right? And when you light it up first, it will give a huge flame that is not very efficient. And then later the quality of the flame will improve and give a brighter flame, right? Are we together, somebody? Now, this week is supposed to be tapping and filled with the Holy Spirit and burning from our hearts outward. And that's why the Lord says, it is very dangerous for us to remain in spiritual childhood, not to grow in the efficiency of the light that we give, the life of Christ we show. You see what I'm talking about here, somebody? It may impair other people, may damage other people. You see that? Let us look at the life of many, many servants here. The life of David. When David, the servant of the Lord, fell to sexual sin, what did David cry out to the Lord during restoration? He said, Lord, create in me a new heart. Hallelujah. Because he knew that the infected heart that he was having, which was infected with sexual sin, would become detrimental, counterproductive, would become toxic, would become infectious, would contaminate, become defiling to the hearts of the people that were his subjects and around him. So he cried out for a new heart. That is the immunity to the gospel that becomes too dangerous to the church, which is actually self-suicidal to the church, because she cannot enter. The Bible says only a perfect and holy bride will enter, a mature bride. And yet we see that this minimum level of anointing brings spiritual childhood, therefore stunted growth, some strange comfort takes place between flesh and Christian walk in the church. So the Christians become comfortable with sin. Hallelujah. No wonder Paul went back to Galatia and he asked the Galatians, who has bewitched you? Ever since you received the Lord, haven't you received the Holy Spirit? And they said, we've not even heard that there is the Holy Spirit. How can that be possible when they needed the minimum level to recognize Jesus as Lord and give Him their hearts become Christians? Which means they are the minimum level of the Holy Spirit, even to give their lives to the Lord. Essentially, Paul was conversationing with them about the added levels of anointing of the Holy Spirit, which they needed to grow into maturity, into full stature, telos in Greek, telos, height, high, stature, mature, so they can enter the kingdom of God. The same thing to the church today. I could essentially ask the church to do the same question. What is wrong with you? Why have you remained infants for a long time? Haven't you heard that there is the Holy Spirit? Haven't you heard that there is increased the added latter anointing of the Holy Spirit that would be poured out unto all flesh, that would redeem you from spiritual childhood so you may mature into the full stature so you may inherit the kingdom of God for which you became a Christian in the first place. Hallelujah. This is absolutely amazing today. But listen to me somebody. The Lord talks about the toxicity, the danger that is eminent and resident and present within the basic level of the anointing that the foolish virgins were operating under. The anointing that would definitely cause them not to enter the rapture, but to be ushered into the tribulation. Look at that, somebody. 
So it means they missed the rapture. And I told you here, and the door was shut. You see that? Let's look at the book of Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 to 18, to look at the toxicity, the dangerousness of this basic level of anointing under which the foolish virgins operated. What an amazing revelation to the church. Revelation chapter 3, verses 15. Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 to 18. Hallelujah. It is toxic to operate in that level. Listen to what he says. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Do you begin to understand the greater depths to the danger that I'm talking about under which these five foolish virgins operated when they refused to receive the added levels of the anointing of the Holy Spirit in the waiting process? I am talking about the real remnant that steps out of the Pentecostal church and they step out in the darkness with their lamps and begin to wait on the coming of the bridegroom, the coming of the Messiah in the rapture. I'm not talking about the world. I'm not talking about the general church, the general Pentecostal church. I'm talking about those that have received revelation that the rapture is near, the midnight is near, which is really the remnant of the remnant. But inside that remnant of the remnant out there, 50%, 5 out of 10, will not enter. That's what the Lord is saying. Even after they hear the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the announcing of the midnight hour, they will not enter because they have only operated under the basic level of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. No wonder they did not take any vial any jar of the oil. Hallelujah. What a tremendous time, somebody. And he says, you are lukewarm, so I cannot take you. You are absolutely lukewarm to me. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 19 to 22, talks about the same thing. Hallelujah. The anointing that is so dangerous, that allows you to be immune to sin, to be numb. In other words, you are numb, you are insensitive to sin. Ah, don't worry, there's so much grace. And Paul says, no, we cannot. The Holy Spirit says, you cannot keep sinning because there is grace. Second Peter chapter 2, somebody, verses 19 to 22. Look at what he says here. You see that? He says, hallelujah, they promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For a man is a slave of whatever has mastered him. If they have escaped the corruption of the world, by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they are again entangled in it and overcome by it, and then they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. In fact, it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it than to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed unto them. Of them... The proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit, and a saw, a pig that is washed, goes back to her wallowing in the mud. Do you see how strongly the Lord speaks about the five foolish virgins? They have known that Jesus is Lord. They have gone even to another level. They have known that they need to be in the Pentecostal church. The church that teaches about the Holy Spirit. Because there are many churches that don't teach the Holy Spirit. You see that? They have, in the Pentecostal church, even known that Jesus is coming soon. The rings are in the sky. It is one minute to midnight, 11.59 p.m. And they have known that Jesus is not returning into the church. He's returning out there in the midnight hour in the darkness. So they have separated as a remnant and gone out into the darkness with a lamp so they may win more souls that are in the darkness. But when they are out there, they still became entangled into the very things of the corrupt flesh that they denounced when they received the Lord. He's saying their final condition 
is worse off at the end than they were in the world. You know why? Because they have not given the right light to the dark world. They have led many astray. Many people have received the Lord and tried to live like them in compromise with sin. And hence many have gone to hell because of them. And their final condition is worse because the Bible says, Don't envy the teachers of the law because they will be held to a higher account for leading many into hell. Their final condition is worse because despite separating out as a remnant, they miss the wedding of the Lamb of God. You see that? It would have been better for them to have remained as they were in the beginning, not lukewarm at all, cold, so the right gospel comes pierce their hearts, get the right teachings that are not compromised with human philosophy, with the compromise of the world, the compromised teachings of the church, prosperity gospels, horizontal preachings of the world, that it would have been better for them to have remained cold, non-born again, non-Christian, and then the right end-time gospel pierced their hearts, the gospel of the holiness of the Lord, the gospel of no compromise to sin, and then they would have walked straight into the rapture of the church, because through walking in holiness, they would have provided the right vessel, that the Lord Jesus would have filled with the Holy Spirit over and over and over and over again. Hallelujah. Let us move to another level. Still talking about the toxicity, the danger that the foolish virgins operated under without knowing. This is the same concept of the modern Christianity. No, I am a modern Christian. Even Paul said it's healthy to drink a little bottle, a little glass. And yet we know today that alcohol has been one of the biggest source of defilement, the biggest instrument that the devil has used to bring road accidents, to kill Christians, to lead to sexual sin among Christians, to lead to drunkenness, to lead to addictions, to lead to all kinds of evil. And the Lord says very clearly here, Drunkenness belongs to those who walk in the night, who walk in the darkness. Do you hear me, somebody? And yet, if you walk in modern Christianity, which is the today's version of the five foolish virgins, walking in the minimum level of anointing, the Christian walk that is mixed with the world, then you would accept it. Because modern Christianity accepts modernity. And yet, in heaven... There is no such a concept or such a phenomenon like modern Christianity. There is only one concept, the perfect and mature bride of Christ. Hallelujah. So we have seen that surely the five foolish virgins were very different from the five wise virgins. And we see an ongoing conversation, even as the Lord was describing them, every letter of every word he used to describe them, was very weighty, was very deep, and had a revelation that spoke to the church. And still in the same level of anointing that they operated in, the five foolish virgins, which level of anointing was very suicidal because it finished them. It did not allow them to enter into the kingdom of God. The purpose of the anointing of the Lord, even the purpose of the Christian walk, of being a Christian, the purpose of salvation is that we may ultimately enter into the kingdom of God. And so, in the same note, you see that they remained in the level of anointing that was basic, that permitted, was porous. So it permitted a lot of influx of the things of the world, a lot of compromise with sin. And yet, out of all this, if one were to summarize it in one statement, one would say that, it spells out the holy nature of the Lord. It means he has zero tolerance to sin. He is holy, holy, holy. Now, in the same note, I'm reading the book of Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6, which explains again the same danger of operating at the spiritual infancy, at uh, spiritual childhood, a level that we have said again is porous, allows winds to sway you left and right. You hear Paul talking about it that don't be like infants who are swayed left and right by doctrines and teachings that are not sound even before the Holy Spirit. And so he says here in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 46, that it is impossible 
for those who have once been enlightened and who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit and who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, he says it is impossible if they fall away to be brought back to repentance because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Surely there is no better climax to describe the limited anointing, the toxic anointing I talked about, under which the foolish virgins operate. And remember all these things the Lord is speaking as a prophecy to the church. It's not something that happened. It is something that is yet to happen. So in other words he's saying there is going to be a church that is going to be comfortable and compromised in sin, going to be comfortable with the minimal level of the knowledge of God. You say, I know Christ, or I know a scripture. And we see this all across the board. We see Christians who can quote a scripture, quote for you a verse, and yet if you look at their very lives, it does not reflect a Christian walk. For example, there are basic tenets of Christianity, like holiness, like the level of conversation you have with the Lord, also in terms of uh, your dressing can be reflected in your dressing if you are a woman or a man in terms of whether you are being fruitful are you reaching out to people these are the aspects of the spiritual work that gauge they operate as parameters to gauge how one is growing one begins to reach out one is spending more time in prayer one can also fast you know these are things that are very important because they are in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus, the very footsteps that we are supposed to follow so we can enter where he went to prepare a place for us that is in the kingdom of God. And here he's saying, if we are going to receive Christ and then get back to the world or allow the world to mix with us, then first of all, we are not even the right full example of Christians being followers of Christ, ambassadors of Christ. Because we are going to fall in the very traps of sin. And even worse, because many times when you become a Christian, you become even a greater target to the devil. So we are going to fall to the same problems that other people elsewhere are falling into. That's why he spoke very clearly in Second Peter chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. He said, they promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. Which means we are locked up with them in the same blindness, in the same darkness. So we cannot even lead them because we don't show the light of Christ. And you see he's bringing this to a greater height where he's saying, essentially, the reason the Lord turns his back onto them and he says, to tell you the truth, I don't know you, is because they have become abusive in this level of Christianity. Because... They are like saying, look, the first crucifixion you had was not sufficient to redeem me. They are trying to send the Son of God all over again back to Calvary. You see that? And to me, this is a very serious event because there was only one final and ultimate crucifixion when the Son of Man was crucified on the cross, a bitter, bitter rejection and crucifixion that redeemed the church. And that's why he's saying, if we are going to operate in a level of anointing that just a starter, Start a level of anointing, which is supposed to be a springboard to throw us to the next level. If we are going to remain at that level of infancy and childhood within this Christian walk, then he says, we don't present the right image to begin with because we bring public disgrace to the Lord. Because we wear his image and yet we wear the image of the devil also. So it's a mix-up, mchanganjiko malum to put it that way in Swahili. It's a mix-up between light and and darkness, a mix-up between righteousness and wickedness. You see that? So that's why the Lord speaks very strongly against the kind of anointing that the church that is symbolized by the five foolish virgins is operating under. And you see that this cuts across the earth. If you go all over the world, you will always find that the majority of the church, more than 95 towards 99%, will operate at this level. That's why the church is young. That's why somebody can come up and mimic and bring falsehood and say he's a prophet. How would you do so if you surely were wise? You see, if surely you were operating under the heavy anointing of the Holy Spirit. 
The prophets of the Lord operate under a very, very tremendous heavy anointing of the Holy Spirit all around them, which affects even the people around them. So how can one purport to be a prophet when they're in falsehood and lies? The very sin that the Antichrist will commit. And that's why you see, that means they don't have the fear of the Lord. Essentially implying they are not wise because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. ¿Qué sería de mí si no me hubieras alcanzado? ¿Dónde estaría hoy si no me hubieras perdonado? Tendría un vacío en mi corazón, vagaría sin rumbo, sin dirección. Si no fuera por tu gracia y por tu amor, si no fuera por tu gracia y por 